Miss Rosati. The following 10 minutes are excerpts from two classical productions directed by Sheila Corregas. Cecile, or the School for Fathers, by Jean Anouy, was presented by the Quake Theatre in New York City. It is written and directed in the style of Moliere, although no classical sets or costumes are used. It is done in a two-thirds round position. The Importance of Being Earnest, by Oscar Wilde, was done as part of a summer stock season in New Hampshire. Both casts are a mixture of equity and non-equity actors. I am single. I am free. Who could find anything wrong in that? I could, heaven knows. You could? Yes. And by what right? By right of... <laughs> <laughs> Your father is entrusted your care to me. The sacredness of your honor is in my hands. It should be my duty to warn your father should you ever be foolish enough to open your door to this little puppy. <laughs> and I assure you, he will be warned. And who would have warned my father then, had I opened it to you, monsieur? Well, in such case. <laughs> oh, stop joking, young man! <laughs> You're the only one who laughs at your jokes. Oh, stop living in a dream world, monsieur. The little chevalier comes here to see Cecile and not me. Oh. Everybody knows it, and you as well. I will even tell you a secret if you swear not to repeat it. But first you must swear. <laughs> Do not trust you completely, monsieur. It is true you are a gentleman, but still, you have two or three personalities, and sometimes you are unable to tell one from the other. Oh, enough, enough, I swear. Heaven alone knows if I understand. Swear on what is most precious to you, and swear that you will never tell anyone. Well, go on and swear. And everything must be according to the rules, so spit as well. Herman, <laughs> <laughs> you are making fun of me. <laughs> there. I swear. And I spit. <laughs> The Chevalier thinks so little of me that he is eloping with your daughter tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Masquerade in a dark cloak and catch a cold in the garden at night just to see if I don't find it in somewhere. <laughs> you are speaking to the wrong person, Mademoiselle. I believe it would be most prudent, Monsieur, if Mademoiselle Cecile told you she had a rendezvous tonight. It was not without reason. I shall lock Cecile in her room and prevent her from playing. I don't know what scandalous part of this little affair between you and your lover. And I shall rest easy tonight. Have no fear. After all, it is no concern of mine if you have decided to ruin yourself. And you are right. But if I were in your place, I would still keep a watch to see if anyone were kidnapped tonight. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now I see that you have never loved me. Yeah. Go to my study. I think of ways not to suffer any longer. I'm too old now to give way to despair. Dear Hedman, I shall tell you what I've decided tomorrow. I'm deeply wounded. <laughs> yeah, there is something I must tell you. It is true I knocked at your door, but I never really insisted. And although God knows how much I love making love, I was almost happy that your door remained closed. What do you mean? Yes, almost happy. Oh, you may already be the mistress of this boy, and I'm making myself ridiculous by speaking to this. I do. I'm not easily respectable, Herman. There is something about a skirt floating around a supple waist which does away with any sense of respect in my mind. <laughs> Yet there are some strong contradictions in 
Watt's heart that I was almost happy in my bitterness that your door remained closed and I learned how to speak. There it is. Ask that young man tonight if he knows anything of this. It only had to be said, monsieur. <laughs> he went through so much trouble for nothing before. And now, without even wanting to, you have found the words which unlock the girl's door. <laughs> oh, poor little men. <laughs> poor little strutting peacocks. <laughs> they spread out their tails as conquerors almost as soon as they're able to walk. And they could have such an easy victory if they knew they only had to be a little wounded and sad. <laughs> but we are certainly not going to teach them that. I have no fears for this one. He will be out in the garden tonight as soon as night falls. He may catch a cold there. <laughs> or he may find one. Or perhaps even both, we shall see. I will tell you a secret. The playwright himself has a joke. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. What are you so amused at? Oh, merely a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only things which are never serious. Oh, that is nonsense, Algy. You never talk anything but nonsense. <laughs> Nobody ever does. Surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours? Especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes I think he is so serious that he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment or triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show they have some sense of shame, Max. They've been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But I haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What a frontery. They're approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing, I have just one question to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Wendell and your common sense is invaluable. 
Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory reply, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't, but that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. <laughs> True! In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity for coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. <laughs> this is not the moment for German skepticism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing. Well, that seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief has said. His voice alone inspires absolute credulity. Oh, then you think we should forgive them? Yes! Except in his domestic life. But I'm sure his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. Generals, Malum, Maximum, Magli, what ghastly names they have. Markby, Mixby, Mobs, Moncrief, Lieutenant, 1840, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869, Christian names, Ernest, John. <laughs> I have always told you, Gwendolyn, that my name was Ernest, didn't I? <laughs> well, it is Ernest, after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes. I remember now the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest, my own Ernest. Oh, I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out that suddenly all his life he has been speaking nothing but the truth. <laughs> Can you forgive me? I can, for I feel you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia! <laughs> Frederick, at last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. 